He has stood in front of a firing squad and had guns jammed into his stomach, but now an award-winning journalist is working through his toughest battle yet, his own personal assignment. John Scully has depression and post-traumatic stress disorder. He's sharing his story in an effort to educate others on how those afflicted by mental health issues are treated by the health care system. Journalist and producer John Scully joins me now in studio. Good morning, John. Good morning. Appreciate you being here. Thank you. How are you doing? I'm doing, not, not doing bad. First thing in the morning is a bit tough because of the drugs from, the over, for, from overnight. But I'm OK. I'm OK, you know. <laughs> You've had a long and amazing career. At what point in the journey did you realize that you were suffering from depression? Um, it was quite a way in. Um, it was diagnosed in the 80s, but I reckon I've been suffering from it well before that. But when I was one night, I was sitting watching TV, and I noticed tears were coming down out of my eyes, and I was, I was crying and for no apparent reason. And it was also, I wasn't sleeping. And those are the two sort of uh, major markers of depression. And so I went and saw a psychiatrist who then zonked me with a, a thousand sleeping pills. And that's when I knew, knew that uh, I was suffering from depression. And it was diagnosed in, in the psychiatric hospital about six weeks later. The PTSD came much later. Um, the depression has been the, the overriding factor in my life, um, and it has, it has driven the PTSD. Um, what depression does is it robs you of your sleep, and what, what happens then is that I get violent, violent nightmares, PTSD nightmares, and um, that leaves me sleep deprived. And when I get sleep deprived, my judgment goes. And therefore, I become suicidal. And um, I've, I've had two suicide attempts, and, and one recently one is recently. one recently is 12, as a, a month ago. And that was a direct result of, of lack of uh, sleep through PTSD fueled by depression. And again, when we come back to your career, you were in war zones, you have covered things that most of us, even in journalism, have not. You've seen things that most people have not seen. Is that what caused the PS, PTSD? I think so. I think um, in retrospect, I, at, at the time, I used to use adrenaline to overcome all the horrible things one, one, one would see. And uh, I just shrugged it off and moved on to the next horrific story. Um, but I think it eventually caught up with me when I stopped, when I came off the road and stopped covering wars and stopped covering the famines and the disasters, then there's a price to pay. And I think I paid that price. I'm paying it now. Uh, I don't regret it. I don't regret it at all. I think that we journalists have a duty and an obligation to get out there and tell the truth, and especially right now, um, that... The journalism has never been more important. And I wish to God I was young enough now to go back out and do it again. So here you are in your 70s, and you're very open about the fact that you did try to take your life not once but twice, and as recently, as you say, as a month ago. What happened, and what was it about that experience that made you want to come forward and talk about mental health care in Canada? Yeah, um... It's always it's been on my mind. I've written a book about um, it's called Am I Sane Yet? I've written a book about depression um, because it's been on my mind for a long time. I don't think it's talked enough about. I think it's in the shadows. And um, I, when I when I had my um, uh, suicide attempt or uh, exposure to suicide this last month, I realised that um, you know. People don't know and won't talk about it. And it's a, it's a hidden secret um, shame. And since I've been posting on Facebook with my daily log about what's been happening to me since I uh, went into my depression mode, I've received dozens and dozens of calls from people hidden in the shadows, suffering brutally through depression and PTSD and yet are too frightened to come out in the open because of the stigma that surrounds mental illness. And I'm determined that I will not, I won't shut up. 
I'm determined that I've got an opportunity to speak. I, I'm a journalist, I can write, I'm an, uh, I have an, uh, an outlet on Facebook and on here, and I will speak as loud as, as loud as I can to get equality and get decent treatment for people who are sick with mental illness. So is it giving you a purpose? Do you feel that demon that was sitting on your shoulder, and those are my words, not yours, a month ago, is gone? Has this given you a new reason to communicate and, and be a reporter again? Um, in a way, yeah. In a way, no. I mean, um, I know I'm not a reporter anymore, um, but... Uh, but um, if, if I can budge the um, conversation a bit more towards talking about, about more openly about suicide and more openly about mental illness, then I will have achieved something and that gives me something to do, yeah. Final question to you. Um, family members, what is your advice to them? if they suspect or if they know that someone in their family is suffering from depression? That is so tough. That is so tough because people, family members are unwilling, a lot of family members are unwilling to admit that their loved ones are suffering from depression and the loved ones themselves um, are having trouble admitting it. And so I think that, the, that my advice is that to, to, to start talking. Talk and listen. Talk and listen are the two mantras for, for people with mental illness. It's so easy to say, but very, very dif difficult to do. But unless you do that, you're never going to get help. John Scully, I wish you nothing but the very best. You take care. Thank you very and much. And we'll check in with you. Great, thank you. You're very welcome.